This episode of the Helping Healing Humor podcast is brought to you by Healing Hands International. I would like for you to think for a moment about how many times you have used water today. You probably brushed your teeth, took a shower, washed your hands, cooked, made coffee, washed your clothes, and even flushed the toilet a few times. How far did you have to walk for it? Across the bedroom? To the other side of the house? Did you know that every day millions of people all over the world get up and walk several miles to search for water? Not to mention that more times than not, the water that they do find is dirty and causes them to get sick. For the past 20 years, churches and individuals have been partnering with Healing Hands International to bring an end to the water crisis by drilling water wells and distributing water filtration systems. HHI empowers Christians to live out their calling to do good to all by providing local opportunities to make a global difference. If you want to be a part of this effort, you can get involved by coordinating a Walk for Water event. Walk for Water is a simple concept. If you want to host a walk, all you need to do is three things. Pick a date, find a location, and get people there. Healing Hands is going to take care of the rest. That's what they're doing for the one planned in our hometown of Florence, Alabama on April 18th at 2 p.m. at McFarland Park. If you want to learn more about how you can help people get clean water, please visit walkforwater.org backslash Ben and Travis. That's walk, the numeral four, water.org backslash Ben and Travis. Join us in changing the water cycle today. Welcome in to the Helping Healing Humor podcast with Ben and Travis. We are glad that you guys are with us once again uh, this week. And of course, Travis is here and Will is here with us. How are you guys doing today? I'm well. I'm doing well. Uh, I uh, I think I drank too much caffeine on Friday night and I was real jittery yesterday. And so I'm trying to get stuff together for our weekly email and also pay attention to Alabama playing basketball. And it was just not a good thing. So uh, I'm yeah. better today. Nice and calm, ready to podcast. I figured the jitteriness was just the Bama game was what I was thinking. There's some extra in there. I don't know where it came from, but or, I'm good today. Or the thoughts about Abilene Christian and what they might could do to Texas that they did to Texas last night. That was impressive. Or the, a couple of nights ago. You know, the religious right? schools are dominating right now. They are. They are. Now, by the time it, this goes sister, through, they'll be gone. But Is it Sister Jean? It, didn't she, like, Loyola just upset – that's the number right. one team. I heard. So. I heard an interesting fact that she actually prayed before the game that Illinois would miss fifty percent of their layups or free throws or something, and that it was actually the number. So I don't. I don't know. I don't know about that. But who so knows? she's still around. We were talking about that the other day. So she's oh, still she's there. still there. She's nice. still there and rocking and rolling. So and we're all saying, Roberts. We we've got some good guests on the podcast, mm-hmm. but a Sister Jean podcast that. Could be could be pretty impressive for the future. That might be amazing. So we may have to may have to work that. So we do have some uh, great guests with us on the podcast today. We have from Healing Hands International. Uh, I'm going to go with the ladies first. Uh, Gillian Kelly, we are glad to have you with us. How are you doing? I am doing well. I picked Abilene Christian, so I'm yes. pretty proud of myself here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> amazing. And of course, Colton Scott is with us as well. How's it going, Colton? It's going very well. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir. Well, we are excited that you guys are here, and uh, we want to learn a little bit more about what you guys have going on. And so, um, have you guys on here to just tell? our listeners and us a little bit about uh, what you guys do. So um, first of all, I guess the first question uh, would just simply be, tell us about Healing Hands International. So Healing Hands, yeah, we've been around about 30 years now. In fact, our 30 year anniversary is coming up. We are a faith-based initiative out of Nashville, Tennessee. Our mission is to aid, equip, and empower low-income communities all over the world, which we do through a variety of ministries. Um, Just real briefly, I'll list them off for you. We have our clean water ministry, our food uh, and agriculture ministry, our Women of Hope ministry. Uh, We have a project called the Magi Project, and then we have our disaster relief, which is sort of what we're probably most well-known for across the country. Um, And so... That is, that's us. Gillen, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I just essentially the way we do that is to empower Christians here to help those communities around the world. So, you know, we work with stateside churches to impact churches around the world, which is 
my favorite part, but I'm sure we'll get in, into some more of that. But yeah, that, that's essentially what we do. Yeah. So like programs like that and many others, I know a lot of uh, mission groups. Um, that's that's really a, a cool part of it is that not everybody can travel to Haiti or to Africa or wherever else, but they can give to help, you know, get people there to do those things. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we, you know, everything that we do as much as we can, we rely on uh, folks who live in the places where we work, who know the people, know the culture, know the language. And so most of the time we're serving as, you know, somewhat of an intermediate between the churches here and the churches there, right. just matching up resources with, uh, you know, the work itself. And so, yeah. Okay. So how long have you guys been a part of Healing Hands? Gillian, you want to take that one first? Yeah. So I, in total, like on staff, I've been there. This is, I'm starting my second year. Um, I've been full-time about a year, was part-time for some time, but then I actually got started at Healing Hands because I coordinated a walk in Tuscaloosa. So I've been around the ministry for five or six years now. So several of those were just as a volunteer coordinator for a walk for water event, but I've been on staff about two years. Okay. Yeah, so I started at Healing Hands the first time in 2014, I think. I worked there for a year, and then I, I left, and then I came back in 2017, at the end of 2017. Uh, and that was part-time. I went full-time uh, at the first start of 2018. So a total of like four years or so in there when it's all said and done. Well, that's really neat that uh, Gillian, especially you, you got started by just being involved in it on the local level, which is what you guys are always encouraging people to do. But that's kind of how it started for you in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, we couldn't do it without people on on the ground for sure. I mean, that that's how all of our programs really work is folks that are at local churches or in the community. They, you know, kind of reach out to us and they want to be involved with one of our programs. So yeah, no, that's definitely how it starts for, I mean, I don't know how many people we have on staff because of that. Um, but yeah, that's definitely how I got started was just coordinating a walk for water event in Tuscaloosa. And then Colton and I kind of started working together some to, you know, use some of the contacts I had to try to grow walk for water around Alabama. And so we've been, you know, kind of working on that for a couple of years, but then I guess I just hung around long enough. They decided maybe they should pay me. So um, <laughs> now here I am. So it was yeah. a, it was a great system while it lasted too because Gillian would work with me but she wasn't employed so I got to take all the credit for everything that she did so now she's <laughs> now, an employee and they're like wow Colton's not yeah. near as see, is he as important thought. anymore yeah yeah, yeah. That's how it goes. So, yeah. like my role on the podcast I just hang around till they put up with hey, okay we'll do this for you Travis so <laughs> I'm down with that so. <laughs> y'all mentioned the walking for water and kind of the world water crisis I know that's been a big part of y'all's ministry so Talk to us a little bit about that, uh, what's going on there, and kind of maybe even the process from the starting of a walk for water to, you know, completion of its goals. Yeah. So, you know, for me, to, going back to getting started at Healing Hands, this is really what brought me to Healing Hands, in fact. So, like in 2013, I was doing political science uh, at, at UNA and just learning about different things, and I somehow uh, became aware of this water crisis where you have, you know, depending on what, which stat you go with somewhere around 750 million people or so that don't have any access to clean water. So they're, they, every day they get up and they walk for their water. The water they get is very dirty. It's making them sick. And it was just, just blew my mind that you could have that kind of situation. And, and that when we have this developed world over here, where we have such luxury and then a two hour flight down to Haiti and it's, you know, you know, the exact opposite. And so me and some friends had this uh, sort of wild hair to start a water charity because we were in college and and pretty dumb. And so we uh, we took a trip to Haiti. Uh, uh, we had a friend who was doing some work there. In fact, Joe Holly, uh, who, who you all may know. And so we went with Joe. And while we were there, uh, I met uh, Kurt, who was uh, the over the drilling team at Healing Hands. We saw a well get drilled and saw the celebration. And I came home. I said, well, forget all of this starting. Uh, I'll just go work for, for those fellas. So I just drove up to Nashville and begged for a job. And 
uh, have been trying to to do that uh, virtually ever since. And so uh, Gillian is much more knowledgeable than I am about the actual operation side and the dynamics. So maybe you you would be best to tell them about the the walk and how it how that goes to the field. Yes, yeah, sure. So the Walk for Water is just part of our clean water ministry. So it's essentially the fundraising arm, although we get you know donations from other sources as well. But what we do is we've got boots on the ground in all the countries where we drill. So a lot of those guys are coming from preacher training schools like you know Bear Valley, uh, Nairobi Great Commission, you know, whatever those the schools are called. So they come and they work for us. And they really start with us as agricultural trainers. So they go out and they're going to use our agricultural training to help them plant churches in their home uh, villages and then use that to kind of spread the word. And then as they are helping people grow gardens, learn how to plant vegetables, well, vegetables don't grow without water. And so it's just a logical progression to then drill in these communities, too. So, you know, we one of the places that we drill is in Zambia. And I'm constantly hearing from our Zambia country coordinator how, you know, people are so excited to have the knowledge now to grow a garden, but they live in a place where they have a dry season and a rainy season. And so they could grow stuff half the year, maybe. And so now that once once we get a well drilled, they can grow consistently. So what we do is our well sponsorship level for a walk for water is seventy five hundred dollars. And for every seventy five hundred dollars to get, we can put a well on the ground. And so um, what how that works, I guess, essentially is in everywhere in every country except Haiti, where we drill, we just use country con- country contractors to do that. And so our, our boots on the ground will coordinate with these folks, go into a village and um, essentially just drill a well. So, I mean, from from the fundraising point on the state side, then we coordinate with folks in country and then the folks in country then kind of just take it over, which is really great. That's awesome. So how many wells have you guys drilled through the years? Do you know? So we did our 1000th well in 2018. Wow. Um, wow. So 2019 was a pretty good year in terms of the number of wells we drilled. 2020, you know, was 2020 and um, the the country restrictions, you know, we, we think we had it hard in America, but people were literally starving to death in places like Z- Zimbabwe because they can't leave their homes. I mean, they were not playing in some of these other countries wow. when it came to restrictions. So people were not allowed out of their homes. And so that means our country coordinators also couldn't go out and drill. So, you know, 2020 was what it was, but now we're kind of getting back on track. We've already drilled several this year. So, well, this may sound like a ridiculously hard question, but do you have any idea how many people kind of on average are blessed with those wells? Yeah. So I think I I wouldn't swear to it, but I think the average would be around 2000. And, And that's with your typical like hand pump well. So, you know, if you go to like countries like Kenya, those wells, just because the water table is so different, that's going to be a, a much, I want to say like a bigger project. you got to put in solar panels. you got to do all sorts of stuff. It's got to be electric. And so those kind of tend to impact a greater spread of people. Um, but our, our typical well is about 2,000 is what you want using it. That's incredible. So is there... You know, when y'all are thinking about all the different places that you can drill wells, I mean, how do y'all go through the process? I know you talked about the agricultural trainees and all that, but like, how do you go and say, hey, we want to put a well right here? Like, how, how does the demographic work or are there certain places that are just always going to be the hot spot for one of the wells? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. So um, historically, we've drilled mostly in Haiti. We had a crew there, we had a rig there, and that was predominantly where we drilled. Now, due to some uh, variety of factors, uh, much of our program has moved over into uh, continental Africa instead. And so in terms of deciding where one gets drilled, it really, and Gillen, you you step in here at any point, but uh, mostly it's the ag trainers come to us and say, here's a situation that works. Here's a church here, here's someone who could you know, maintain this well, oversee it, what have you. And that then gets put on a list. 
And then as soon as we get donors for it, we start matching donors and places. Um, you know, there are a few situations that are unique, like, uh, uh, you know, we had a relationship with a congregation in Kenya uh, recently where they had just, um, they had done a lot of work and had really demonstrated uh, a willingness to, to uh, sort of help those around them. And so they, they sort of got put on a special, you know, little list for us to make sure we got water to them. But typically it's just matching up spots with donors and that's kind of how it goes. Yeah. Would you like to add anything to that Gillian or was that close enough? Yeah. Uh, you did good. No, I would say um, maybe, you maybe just to add, <laughs> pat, pat, pat him on the back there, Ben. <laughs> but uh, no, just to add a, a little bit to that, I guess, we do have some, I guess, criteria that helps our ag trainers kind of look for places. Like it's got to be on public land. It has to benefit, you know, it has to be for public <clears> use. <throat> you know, we can't have Joe down the street say, hey, yeah, that a well would be great. You know, I'm tired of walking for water. And then Joe has water all the time. So, I mean, you know, you get situations like that and we, we don't do stuff like that. So if a well is can be for public use and it can be maintained by people in the community, you know, we're, we're pretty interested in that. One thing that uh, when I visited down in Haiti was a lot of the wells are connected to churches, right? Right. Okay. I th you know, I thought that's pretty cool that, you know, there's always a direct connection to what y'all do physically, but also spiritually as well. And so putting those, wells in specific places that help the spiritual aspect of, you know, those people's lives is a big deal. And probably I, I can't speak for your ministry, but probably just as significant of a point to help them spiritually as it is physically as well. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah the churches, church buildings, church locations, that's always going to be, you know, key, you know, when we can match that up. So if, if there's someone like a, if you're a church here in the States and you have some mission point, you know, in a place where we do work and you have some communication with, you know, some ongoing communication with that work and they don't have water and you say, hey, I would like to to take care of that. Well, that would be a situation where Healing Hands could potentially come in and say, all right, well, we know how to make that happen. So uh, we do quite a bit of that. Very cool. So I, I was uh, at Riverside. Our school actually does the Magi boxes every year and uh, that's always a big hit our kids love doing it um, and i'd say probably on average at least every student does one uh and of course that's helped out there are some students who do five you know and, and that's always a big hit at school but you know kind of along those lines uh, which that's something we might could have you guys back on and talk about that too but uh you know yeah, we are doing next week there you go so it <laughs> uh, sounds good to me um you know how do you go about raising money uh, for these wells, uh, and maybe how can, you know, we, how can the people listening find a way to support and help out in that? Yeah. So that's where I come in, I guess. Uh, first off, if they could just reach real quick to their checkbook, if they have one handy, <laughs> start writing some numbers, the bigger, the bigger, the better. Yeah. So, so I do, I work on the development team for healing hands. So I'm, I'm involved in, in trying to help, uh, raise some of the funds for these things. Uh, I have found personally that the walk for water is really about the best way for healing hands to sort of introduce itself and this work into a particular area. And so just to give you, uh, I'll just give you a specific example. So like a few years ago, you know, we reached out to some friends down in Birmingham. <clears throat> I don't, I'm, he wouldn't mind me saying Chuck Webster over at the Hoover Church of Christ. And uh, I know you guys earlier when we were talking, y'all you know, mentioned Palisades. And so we had Daniel Currington and uh, some some other uh, uh, over at uh, Asheville Road and Decatur Highway. And they all got together and said they wanted to do a walk for water together collectively, the four churches for a, a Birmingham area wide. And so once we had that initial meeting with everyone and sort of explained what it was, how it works, how simple it is to host one and all of these you know, various things. At the conclusion of that, each of them asked us to come to their church building, give a presentation, show everyone there sort of, you know, what it what dirty water actually looks like, what clean water looks like. Juxtapose these pictures together and let everyone just sort of learn about it and make a decision on whether it sounds like something they want to get involved with. And so to me, that has been the key 
for the growth that I've seen since I've been here is just getting the story in front of people, getting a platform to have conversations with folks, because the story really does tell itself. I mean, most Christians here in the States probably just aren't aware of what the situation is. And when they actually see it, most are compelled to do something, whether it be give resources, uh, which is money, which helps a lot uh, to be praying for the work, to be praying for those involved, to tell someone about the work. Ha they have a youth minister friend or pulpit minister friend or whatever kind of friend who lives somewhere else who may want to host a walk or get involved. That's really the way that we've seen it sort of grow. So uh, I mean, we have marketing efforts and things like that, but I, I really like the one on one conversation. That's what we're always trying to to make happen. So it's kind of touch touches at the heart of people when, you know, the whole freely you receive freely give. So you're going to get to go to the movie theater and whatever movie you want is going to play at the movie theater. It doesn't matter how old, how long ago it was. So what movie is it going to be? And what candy are you going to go candy or popcorn? If you go candy, what candy? And then what are you drinking? What's what's your movie going perfection? And whoever wants to go first can go. Maybe who are you taking? That that might <laughs> that be might the other. <laughs> well, ahead, okay. All right, I'll go. You can find my favorite movie in your local five dollar bin. Okay, I'm the only person that thinks this movie is good, and that is fine with me. That's fine. You got mail. Um, no. We bought a zoo. <laughs> yeah, we bought a zoo. Is the oh. most underrated movie i think that is, is it's a good movie. movie it's a good movie i've seen it i love that movie so i I, could, I couldn't take any of my friends to go see that with me because i've all i've made them all watch it so many times already uh so that they would not go i would have to go by myself and that would be fine i would do that um i would probably drink you know, I don't think you can get sweet tea like not decent tea at a movie theater but i would bring my own probably my purse They'll let uh, you sneak it in at your movie theater. So I'll go <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Are you telling me you sneak stuff into the movie theater? Oh, this is going to be recorded. I guess I should probably not say that. <laughs> Sinner. Um, Sinner. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, there's there are reasons to carry big purses, right? Uh, yeah, so I would drink um, half sweet, half unsweet Milo's tea. And my snack would probably be popcorn. Popcorn, mm -hmm. extra butter. It's a good choice. It's a good choice. All right, Cole. Yeah. Yeah, a uh, movie would probably be A Brother Where Art Thou with popcorn and chocolate. I'm doing oh. both. I'm going oh. with popcorn Are and mixing it in and saying the that. Roller. Yes. <laughs> and the Nest the little the Nestle Crunch. Is that it? The, yeah. the little crunch. Yes. With All a right. Coke. And we'll feel miserable about my choices for about three days after that. Me nice. too, man. I'll be all twitchy. I just can't yeah. do it for Alabama games. <laughs> Hey, thank you guys so much for being with us. This has been awesome. Uh, it's been a good visit. I know we've all got to scatter our different ways, um, but thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate it. Good to see you. We talk a lot about the importance of mental and emotional health on the podcast, but what if you're concerned about the emotional health of a child? Sometimes after a major change, a child may begin to struggle emotionally or socially. You can tell that they are struggling because they might begin to behave badly or have extreme feelings of worry or sadness. They might even engage in destructive behaviors or regress in their normal development. Children don't have the ability to express their concerns verbally as you and I do. Play therapy might be the answer. In play therapy, toys are like the child's words and play is the child's language. Amy Thompson at Serenity Counseling helps children who may be struggling emotionally or socially learn more adaptive behaviors. Through play therapy, a child can also learn to communicate with others, express feelings, develop problem-solving skills, and learn a variety of ways of relating to others. Give Amy a call at 256-263-6367 to find out more about how play therapy might be just what you've been searching for. Registration for Titus Camp is now open at hcu.edu. Titus stands for Teens in Training for Useful Service. Titus is a leadership training camp that promotes public speaking, Christian service, and is hosted on the campus of Heritage Christian University. 
Titus provides a speaking assignment to every single camper at local churches in the Shoals area. Join me at this year's session, July 11th through the 18th. Be sure to register today for only $25 by clicking the link in our description. Thanks for being with us for this episode of the Helping Healing Humor Podcast. Be sure to download our free ebook, 28 Days of Focus Living, at benandtravis.com and receive all of our helping healing and humor extra content directly in your inbox. We look forward to having you join us at the same Ben and Travis time, same Ben and Travis channel.